Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Soul Syndicate. Uh, it's Richard here, and we have a special guest today, Maureen Whitehouse. Um, we have worked together on different projects. She was part of our source for a while, and um, she's a really high-level soul, and I really wanted to bring her here to share some of her deep, uh, deep wisdom. Um, I saw her, I don't know, about a month ago in Nashville, she came and attended one of our events there. It was amazing to see her again. Um, let me give you a little bit of background about Maureen. Welcome, Maureen. Welcome to the Soul Syndicate. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me, Richard. Appreciate yeah, it. no problem. And I'll keep it, I'll keep it kind of short because I want to turn over the reins to her to get going. Um, and she's going to be talking about, um, the miracle mindset, overcoming obstacles to creating miracles in your life. And um, if you've been around me for a while, sometimes I talk about the pyramid of possibility. And a lot of, uh, of us think that uh, a lot of things are outside our range of what we can do. A lot of us sell ourselves short and we actually don't really know what God's plans are. And then a lot of us also I uh, think things have to be like struggle and difficult. So hopefully Ma Maureen's going to help us to see that. And I hope, I hope she'll share a little bit of how this information came about because it's a yeah. remarkable, a remarkable story. Um, she, uh, she, she, she's been silently healing, healing others for a long time. She has a, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, a doctorate from Harvard in their divinity school. Is that, do um, I have it right? Um, an MDiv, Master in Divinity. Master yeah. in D D Divinity. Uh, and so she's kind of quietly, uh, well, she shifted and had a previous career, which I'll let her tell, tell you about if she wants to, uh, and is just kind of doing the silent work on the planet. And uh, she's really a light. Her presence is filled. So Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Maureen, uh, for your your miracle masterclass because uh, you're kind of one of those people that makes the miracles happen in our life. Uh, blessings! Yeah. Thank you so much again for coming, and thanks for everybody Thank showing you. up for this special edition class. Thank you again. I appreciate everyone being here. We have a beautiful sunny day for a change here in New England. I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and so um, I can see how everybody kind of coming in for this experience, I'm going to value your time and everything about it. So, huh, okay, so this is the real deal. It's not, when, when I speak with people, it's not just um, giving information about things that you've probably heard before in all kinds of different circles. This is actually a transmission of energy. It's getting you to remember who you came here to be and who you are. So I'd like to just to that end to begin with the most important thing and that's the silence within us and connecting with that. So let's just take a one minute time here to take a beat and just let yourself begin to go inside, close your eyes if that's comfortable to you and allow yourself just to take a nice big deep deliberate breath. And breathe right now as though this is the first breath that you have ever breathed in your entire life. Connect with that breath so deeply that you're really feeling how remarkable that is. That you came into this life with your first breath and there wasn't one person in that room when you arrived that didn't say, ah, oh, a miracle. And feel it like they tingles to their toes and goosebumps everywhere when this new being arrives fresh from the cosmos and just feel that now for yourself as you breathe this next breath and feel yourself being animated by this breath and this is the spirit of you beyond all kinds of labels beyond all kinds of forms or religions when you come into this life you come in with the animating force that is the truth of you, the perfection, the pristine perfection of you that arrived on planet Earth to inhabit this particular body, this wonderful body that you call you. So take a few more breaths this way. Just let's take three nice, big, deep centering breaths. Feel yourself breathing through every cell and organ and system of your body, blessing every cell and organ and system of your body. 
and feel yourself just breathing right through your mind to clear out your mind. Don't have to think, nowhere to go, nothing to do, just listening to my voice right now and receiving. This is a challenge for most humans to just receive, not have to deserve anything or do anything, but just to be here in a receptive place. So one more nice, big, deep, deliberate breath and come into this room where you're in and into this experience as though you're entering life for the first time, as though you're bringing that beautiful spirit of that newborn energy with you, just appearing on this planet with all kinds of capacity to cultivate wonder and to not need to know what it is, but to be able to be here fully. So. Um, I'm Maureen Whitehouse, and I really believe that everything in life is either a miracle or a miracle in the making. Since you came in miraculous, you can't do anything about that. That was the whole reason you arrived, to be a miracle. And every day, all day, I believe there's only one problem and one solution. You're a miracle, and you forgot. If you're having any problem at any time, any day, it's because you forgot who you are. And so this whole class that we're up to today is going to be about remembering. I'm going to give you lots of little touch points so that you can, each time it's like a zing, it's like cattle prod, getting you back on this path to remembering and forgetting everything else, forgetting all the stuff that you might've brought or the challenges or the problems or the things that you want to cultivate in your future. Just forget about that for now. And let yourself just be here like an empty vessel ready to receive everything that you're ready for. So Richard said that I should give you a little bit of the backstory. I'm going to make it as brief as I can. But this is the reason why I now teach people about miracles is because I know with all of my heart after now 20 seven or so years of being awake to this world of the miraculous, which is running parallel in our lives, right next to the same life we have that can be filled with drama and pain and challenges and problems. It's almost like railroad tracks. And you can jump back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, which many people on the planet do from pain to peace and then relative peace and back to pain and back to a problem. And it's pretty much normal as a human on planet earth to experience that if you're having a good time right now, the other shoe is going to drop eventually, <laughs> or something will come along that feels as though, you know, I don't have the agency to be able to contend with this or do this myself. So I was a typical normal person. I, I started out life being more of a sensitive kid where I actually used to like to go, there was my, the church, the school that I went to was a couple blocks up the street and I'd actually go in before school started in the morning and just sit there in the church in the silence. And I always resonated with spirit, but I didn't like going to church because there's too many people I'd get like, I feel like I was going to get sick and, and I just didn't like all the people there, but I always liked the, the part of it that at the time I didn't know was more of the contemplative part of spirit. And so when I got to be older and to college and, and beyond, I kind of like put that on a back burner because that was a little weird. <laughs> you know, that wasn't like the, the thing that people were teaching me was the way to be successful or the way to have fun or the way to be normal in life. And so I kind of did this regular thing, college partying and all that kind of stuff. And afterwards, I actually wound up modeling in New York City. So talk about going from a world the reason why I say that is because I went from the world of feeling more of a contemplative nature or a deeper calling for my life. And I wound up in the most superficial forum in the world, you know, Madison Avenue and, and all the fashion world and things like that. And I have to say, as a creative at heart, I loved the experience of that, but I was in it for quite a while. For I started in my early 20s and I grew the business grew with me so that I was the young mom and commercials I was the bite and smile and and the girl next door throughout my career so it kind of grew with me and I stayed doing that for quite a while 
And because I did so many commercials and things, I was able to really make my life look perfect. You know, I was could I worked with lots of people on commercial sets who were stylists and and all kinds of set designers. And so my home and my life, when I started a family and had kids and my dog could have been on a commercial set, my kids could have been on a commercial set, the uh, everything in my home was like the Zen gardens and everything looked so picture perfect, but I'd wake up in the morning with a pang of something's wrong, what's off, I'm doing this the best I can. And I'm, uh, you know, on the outside, I look successful on the outside, I look fine, but something's dramatically wrong. And I felt a, a pit in my stomach that made me really want to go find out what's wrong with me. And so I was between auditions one day in a small little bookstore. And I used to frequent just because during the time of my New York, New York City and things, I'd go into the backs of temples or churches. It didn't matter where it was, gardens to get away from like the hectic mayhem and go in and be quiet, light a candle or things like that. But I never told anybody I was doing that. And I also knew that there was a part of me that was missing and I kind of had an inkling what it was because I remember those days of being in solitude and, and being more contemplative. So I went into a bookstore and by this time I had read all the self-help books of the day. This was almost 30 years ago. So the, the, the bookstores weren't full of self-help then. They were very like a one bookshelf in the bookstore. I went up to it and I said, read that, read that, know that, positive thinking, blah, blah, blah. I've been like a poster child for positive thinking. And still it was like, okay, you can pour pink paint on this stuff, but it still doesn't feel satisfying. And so I went turned around and I saw in a bookshelf underneath the window of this bookstore, a book that was sort of shining at me. I can't explain that, but it was just like riveting to me. So I went over and I picked it up and it fell open to a page and I read it and it said, I am not a body, I am free for I am still as God created me. The book is A Course in Miracles. And I read that sentence and it was like, it hit me right between the eye. It hit me like right in my heart. It was, there was no other sentence in the entire world that could have hit me more than that because I was a body. I'm the bite and smile in commercials. I'm a clothes hanger as a model. I'm, I'm a body. I'm making my living as a body. And I feel like a body because all I could do with my family and things was perform for everybody, you know, perfect meal, perfect everything. It was all out of a magazine. And I shut it. I'm crying in the store. I shut it and I bought it here. I'm really funny because I was going to read you some. This is, this is the book. This is the one I've had for all these years. Of all my multiple bookmarks that don't even mean anything anymore because there's so many bookmarks that, that there are, it's all bookmarks because everything in there I find profound. And, it, and for all these years, um, it's something that has been the anchor for all of the work I do with people and for my own awareness in life that miracles are real. And so what happened is I took the book home, put it on a shelf, and then started to be like, walk through the room. And it scared me because I knew there was an impact that happened. I kind of look at it and say, I got to read that book someday, thinking I could just read it like the Bible. And I finally did pick it up. And I started to read it. And because it was so impactful, I said, I don't want anyone else in my life to have anything to say about this, to naysay me or to think. I turned it quick over to the back to make sure there was no cult because it starts about shifting your mind. And I saw there was nothing in there to take me anywhere but with myself. And I put it under the couch and started daily practice of studying it and doing the lessons. And as I did, I was becoming really not noted, knowing what was going on, but my whole life was shifting. I was, it's actually how to be a mystic in your own life, because it's talking about your own life and how you view it and see it all differently. I didn't know any of this at all. I was just doing the lessons the best I could, and I typically fail. It took me almost three years to do the lessons because it would say things like, I am the light of the world. Today, I'm the light of the world. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, right. And then by the end of the day, I would be like yelling, I'm not Mother Teresa. <laughs> or like I, I would be so frustrated with myself for not being able to, to do this. And 
as I went along, I finally, the voice of the book, it was scribed, it's a channeled work, it was scribed to two psychology professors at Columbia University, a woman named Helen Schuckman. She was a Jewish agnostic, uh, did not like that this voice of the course is the voice for Jesus. And he's telling, you know, like, if you think of anybody throughout history that knew about miracles, this guy is the miracle guy. And what he's really teaching, again, is how to see miracles in your world every day, all day, but also the fact that you are the one who brings them to life. And of course, when you begin a real true spiritual practice like this, there's all kinds of resistances because we think we know we're a work in progress, but we think we're flawed, deeply flawed. And even when we have an ego that's raging and, you know, wants to be out there in the world and the public eye being all successful, even the most successful people have a voice inside that's holding them back, like tethering them to a smaller self, to a smaller experience here. So it's a human condition. It happened when we slapped on these physical bodies and then we began to have a conditioned life that was seen through two eyes and touched with two hands, this world of duality. And yet there's a part of us that still stays in sweet repose and absolute awareness. So this is about this path that, and you know, especially you here who touch lives, you touch lives, you care, or else you wouldn't be in Richard's group. You wouldn't be in this place where you care about consciousness or or getting a message out into the world or being someone who's going to affect things in a positive way. You care. You deeply know that you care. Well, now it's time to go even a little deeper than that because this is for you first. You have to own it for you first before you can give it. And it's vital that you recognize that you literally came here to be a miracle. And so if you're dissatisfied in any way, it's because you're not being who you came here to be now. So I'm going to highlight. So what happened after that is I did the lesson. So I'm going to briefly go through what happened to get me to be in a consistent place where I see miracles all day, every day, and where I know for a fact that we are all meant to experience miracles all day, every day. And if you're not experiencing that, then you're off your path. You got to tweak it a little bit. It's not that you're flawed. It's that you're off the path just a little bit like those parallel tracks you're running the wrong track you're running the one that isn't satisfying but there's a way back so i have ways to help with this and and to highlight what's common blocks for everyone one first thing before we get into this to know it's not you you're not flawed this is the human condition that's why it's so challenging for so many people to feel like a what it what me yes you if not you, who? If not you, then we're waiting and sitting here twiddling our thumbs, waiting for somebody out there to do this when each and every one of us has this capacity within us, without exception. You know, I've worked in maximum security prisons. I've worked in schools with kids killing each other. I've worked in places that are pretty harrowing to be in. And I will tell you, the miracle exists there and the miracle as an embodied person exists there. I have never seen a place where it's not. I have never seen a place where you can't remind someone on earth who they are when you are actually telling the truth with a capital T. Okay, so what happened then is I did the lessons and took me three and a half years. And one day I realized I had done what the course promotes throughout all the lessons, the background hum is forgiveness. And it's not the kind of forgiveness we're used to like, oh, you, you were really bad to me. You hurt me, but I'm the bigger person. So I'm going to forgive you. It's nothing like that. It's recognizing that had you been awake at the time, had you been connected to your true self, you would have acted differently. You would have seen it differently. It would have been a different scenario. So there's always two to tango. We get to heaven two by two. We also stay in hell two by two. And so if you're in this place where you watch your life and you think there's all these other things going on and people did this to me or they did that to me like I was definitely entrenched in, or I thought everyone else had the influence and that I'd have to show up and perform for them to be by their standards. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I... I've had forgiven everyone in my world. Everyone who I tangibly thought had done something to me 
after all these years, I did it. I, I went in and said, you know, actually, he's not a bad guy. You know, I, my, one of my last ones with my brother, I had an Italian mother and she put my brother on a pedestal and we could like, you know, get all A's in school and things. My brother could flunk out and he was still the prize brother. So, but he didn't do anything. But in my mind, I had a, a resentment. And then I remember forgiving him and I was like, what is that all about? Who, who cares? Like, really, who cares? And when it happened, when you truly forgive, it releases such, um, so much bandwidth. It lets you show up to life with new capacities that you discover your miraculous capacities. Didn't know this then. But so I forgave the last person and then I was alone in my home and the kids were in school because they were young at the time. And I said, I forgave everybody. And it dawned on me. It was like a revelation dawned on me, like a boof, lightning bolt dawned on me. You have one person left to forgive. And it was me because I was the common denominator in all the drama in my life. And, you know, up until that point, I don't know had I could if I could have forgiven myself because I really thought I was deeply flawed. And in all of this practice over these years, I I was able to overcome my perceptions that were hurtful and harmful to me. But when I did that, I kind of like I really did this. No one was home. So I got on my knees in front of one of the chairs in the living room. And I, I said, Maureen, I forgive you. And I can't describe the elation that I felt because it was like, how crazy was I? I never had to micromanage things. I never had to assess and judge and control or manipulate things. Now I never have to do that again for the rest of my life. And because I understood what I did for the first time, I understood I did this and it really, really hit home. So I went about the rest of my day. My husband was out of town. And that night I went to sleep in, I was the kind of person who was fearful. And so I had the dog up near the window, you know, watching. I had the alarms on the house. I always had like scissors under my mattress. I had the kids in bed with me and they were only like three and, and seven at the time. And I woke up at three o'clock in the morning. Now I can't tell you how, because I set up the scenario, like the house, I had the alarms on and stuff. But if I had ever woken up at three o'clock in the morning before this, it would, I would never get back to sleep. It would have been drama, trauma. I would have been up and like, you know, checking every door, every window. And instead the miracle, first little miracle was that I said, Hmm, I had a little bit of cramps in my stomach. And I said, Hmm, I believe in miracles, heal this. And I was speaking to the divine instead of being in that fear mode, I was being in a loving mode. And in that moment, I shot out of my body and went into the heart of God. Now, when I, I, I spoke to, you know, being around the circles at Harvard and stuff, I to spoke to a neuroscientist uh, one time and he said, you know, that's, that is, an ecstatic experience what you had is an is what when you see people who were saints and things if you watch they have this experience where it's almost like epilepsy that there you go and you can see when you see images of saints their eyes go way up and their and the tongue like in kriya yoga and traditions they teach to put your tongue at the roof of your mouth to for this electric connection and in meditations and things. So I walked, I didn't know any of this stuff because this all just happened to me. So I, and the heart of God, there's no description because you're back to that pre-birth state where you're in, you are perfection in perfection as perfection. It's, it's all light, all light, but, but with such unspeakable love that you know you are it. And that that's the reality of us all, that we are impeccably complete in, in absolute love. I stayed there for, you know, after years of this, I had studied different yogic traditions to see what happened because I knew I was breathless. I knew I wasn't breathing from that was three o'clock in the morning because I had looked at the clock 
And when I came out of this, I came down in layers and had revelations at each layer. When I got to this place where it was um, linear again, instead of vertical, I started to see my life revision, the life review. But instead of seeing, I saw it in intimate detail, like couldn't possibly have happened in this short amount of time. I saw every moment of my life and I saw the highlighted parts was the pain in my life. All the painful things, you know, real painful things, miscarriages, things that were painful. And I saw them through the eyes of the divine. I was at one with the divine still. And what happened is it felt like a rolling thunderous chuckle that was saying, now you see how I see. Now you see how I see. And I was seeing through the eyes of the divine without that ego filter, without the filter that we micromanage our lives with. And I saw all that pain as hysterical. It was a rolling laughter, thunderous chuckle. Now you see how I see that you could never have been hurt. You could never have been harmed. You are divine. Your, your reality, the truth of you is divine. So I came out of that experience, at, it was 7.30 in the morning and it's time to get the kids to school. And I came back like this and with the first breath and I was literally on fire. I felt like I was on fire. My heart was blazing, everything was blazing. So I look and see the kids and I'm like, what just happened? My, my mind is stunned. I got up to go to the bathroom to wash my face, to just throw water on my face, to get myself composed. And when I came up to look in the mirror, I saw myself without a body. I saw a beautiful light being with eyes that were golden, looking at me with such unconditional love, it nearly knocked me off my feet. I was loving myself back the way that we are, the love that we are. For the first time, I was receiving the love that I am. And so I, that didn't compose me, but I still didn't know what to do with this because I didn't know what was happening and went through the next three days where my mind was completely still where I watched life through the eyes of God, my God self, without the ego filter. And it was so astoundingly beautiful that I can't tell you how every single thing is orchestrated for us to awaken us to beauty and the truth of who we are and the love that we are and in the inherent miracles all around us, miracles everywhere. Birds were singing like symphonies. The grass was like splintered emeralds. The kids meeting their parents at the playground at school was like making me cry. I, I almost couldn't get off my knees. And I remember one particular instance, I went to the craft store because one of my kids was in the middle of a school project. And when I went in there, there was a girl in a wheelchair that was being pushed by her mom. And she had a, a nothing but a wheelchair and a tray in front of it with a button that said yes and no, because she was um, having problem communicating and she was being wheeled around. And I remember I could barely keep my eyes off her because she was so beautiful. It was almost like I was stalking her through the aisles because when she turned an aisle, I just was like, wanted to see. And I, the only thought I had in my head is, do you know how beautiful you are? Do you know how beautiful you are? And as she came around the corner, she pushed the yes button. And you know, I'll tell you, that's, just what this world is, the world of the miraculous. It's, it's astoundingly beautiful. Nothing, no stone unturned is everything, everything from the smallest little piece of this. So from that point on, I was just compelled to, I, you know, I kind of stopped going on auditions. I was still in the throes of being a commercial actor and things, but I wasn't, I was always the person that kind of was the behind the scenes bite and smile thing. I wasn't like a, the dramatic actor. I was the person who um, could show up and put the clothes on and stuff. And I, st I started having people call me out of the blue. They started coming to me 
and with all kinds of challenges and pain and problems. And so I started doing that instead of auditions. <laughs> And it kind of like morphed that instead of going on the auditions, because I had always gone to different, you know, studios and things, I just went to people's houses. I did house calls for for things. And it and what happened is in the very beginning, they were in clusters. So I didn't know that I knew how to see through pain till I started having people call me with pain. I was pretty much in a world where I isolated myself. I also thought if I hear other people's problems, I'll I'll own them. So this was a new world for me. But what happened is people came in clusters. So in the beginning, and again, they were pretty challenging. As a normal person, I never would have brought these things into my life. People like with incest would call and it would be all in a row. They would be in, in a, it was as if I had a, a master person uh, giving me um, appointments on the book. I didn't even know where these people lived. They just give me their address. And it would wind up that they'd be a you know a few blocks away from the person. There'd be an organic restaurant for lunch right in the middle there. And and I started to learn what people what people think that causes this experience they have, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional. Brain tumors was a whole bunch of people came in that cluster, and and that happened for like the first year where I got to see from the divine tutoring me in all the world's pain. How do you how do you see through this? So again, we'll default back to in all of this, you're a miracle and you forgot. That's the one problem that all of us have miraculous capacity. All of us are divine to the point that we are as divine as the divine laughing at my pain that we can move through anything if we connect with our divine self. So um, I'm going to now, just give you the things that are the most tangible ob obstacles that we all live every day that stop us from experiencing these miracles. So this is where you might want to um, maybe take some notes and see if there's something in your life that's one of these that could be blocks to the miracles that you deserve to live. First one, just be sure that you know that you have to believe that you're worthy. So number one, your identity. If you are identifying with someone who's flawed or is not worthy, or you're feeling disconnected, not just to other people, but to a sense of, of, of a deeper self, then, then you would know this because the, the feeling or the mantra going on in your head is I'm not, fill in the blank. I'm not, fill in the blank. And notice if your days are filled with I'm nots, that it can feel like you're tied up in knots and that you can feel really restricted and, and that things are really problematic and they continue to compound. So that first block is our identity. You're divine. And now all you have to do is reconnect. It's not something you do or perform in the outside world. It's a way that you sink in to your deeper self. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's sinking into yourself so that your true nature gets a chance to come to the surface and, and be the one that you're, you know, it's leading the way in your life. The second most prevalent obstacle, and this is pretty interesting because in school you learn to pay attention. And in school you learned to pay attention to the teacher. But the second obstacle is attention to what is, to what is right now. Think of how many times you come upon something that is a problem. And then we give an inordinate attention while it's a problem, instead of recognizing that that's just happening now, there's always, and then, then there's this. There's always, an, and then there's this. And how we move into the, and then there's this depends on, are you on the path of pain and problems or are you on the path, the parallel path that's miraculous? It's a slight shift. In A Course in Miracles, it says miracles are a shift in perception. You're shifting over to that parallel path and you're saying, okay, if I fixate on what is right now, then I'm gonna try to control the outcome or control my surroundings. We have to default to control. 
And instead, if you just like stop, and I'm going to give you a mantra here, that's really, really helpful. I don't know what this is, but I love it. I don't know what this is, but I love it. If you default to love about whatever it is, so think about the problem you have with your neighbor. Think about your, the ch your problem child. Think about the problem in your life. If you don't know what it is, you cannot address it from the place that it, the problem was begotten. You know, Einstein said it. If you're going to address the problem from the place that it began, you're not going to get the answer because that's a, the shift in perception is key. If you don't shift and say, well, wait a minute, I'm divine. Why would I create this? And believe me, we create every problem in our life to awaken. One problem, one solution. You're divine, you forgot. And every single problem we have is that we forgot we're divine. We And, and what I mean by divine is no labels from any kind of um, entities. Your love, your unconditional love, but your unconditional love, that means no condition is going to make you stop loving. No condition. So if you're fixated on the condition, that means you can't be unconditional. Let's say that again, because your breath, feel your breath. You came in with that first breath. The only thing that conditions it is being in your body, being breathed by you right now. But other than that, it's invisible. It's unconditioned. It's your spirit. It's all around you. It's unconditionally supporting you. Did you have to beg your breath to breathe you this morning? It's unconditionally supporting you. So when we let go of these labels and we choose love over fear, we start to see that love has no edges if you're really being unconditionally loving. It doesn't have edges. You don't say, well, I'll love him until he does this. That's what I did all those years, the things that I had to forgive. I'll love myself unless I do this. And come on, you're always going to be having that inner critic that's going to be critical of somebody or something that's going to take you out of heaven. So attention to what is, is because we have a fear of the unknown instead of realizing, I don't know what it is but I love it. If you can start loving the unknown, you're like 99% there. The next one is crisis intervention. We only seek miracles in dire times, or we only like say, help me to the divine or do things that feel like out of context to our normal control life. If things are really, if the shit really hit the fan. And when that happens, we don't get a chance to revel in miracles all day, every day. And there's a lot of pressure on us. It's like saying, okay, I'm going to stop a moving car that's going down a hill and I'm going to stand in the middle of the hill while it's going really fast. Instead of getting to the top of it, stopping the car while it still has the brakes on and, and don't need it to be a big challenge. If you're focused on this divine part of you or this loving part of you every day, I don't know what it is, but I love it. That's all you have to do is default to that. You start to feel that it's it's much easier to not just see that you need a miracle when it's dire times. Okay, another one that many people default to is numbing ourselves as a way to cope instead of seeing our capacity to be able to be interactive and engaged in challenges or problems. Our feelings are so important. You know, everything I described to you about those, the days where my mind was still, I was feeling everything. I was feeling the grass growing. I was feeling the birds singing. If we numb ourselves, we can't do something that's really critical here. We have free will. We were given this capacity to, to think we're separate from the divine and have a very believable experience of I'm separate because I have a body, you have a body, everything's separate. I touch this and I touch that. So we're in the world of duality very tangibly. But if we want to connect deeply, we have to be able to feel. And so instead of numbing ourselves or making sure that everything is a, a panacea or start to feel everything, the, the, if it feels wonderful, yay. If it feels awful, yay. Because what happens is when we start to feel our feelings, we actually have agency in our own lives. We have the capacity to choose what does actually feel 
personally fulfilling for us or awful for us. I can't tell you how many clients over the years have been really successful, say, physicians that I've had, and they wanted to be musicians. They never wanted to be a physician. And they're sick themselves, and they're tired themselves. And when they feel what it was that was the thing that they wanted to do their whole life, it's so liberating because sure, they can still do that if, they, if they're a great physician, but now play more music and do the things that deeply fulfill you most. If we numb ourselves as a matter of coping, then we're not living the life we came here to live. Which brings me to the next one. The next obstacle is a lack of presence. And you know, we all hear about now and, and, and being present with things, but this is so key here because if miracles are everywhere and most of the world is stuck in that dualistic and calculating and judging mind that's all fearful, feel it now, feel it in the places in the world, this judging, calculating, fearful mind. It gives us a sense of false superiority. It gives us a sense of false righteousness and, and, and a sense of, of really stuck in, in a security that's very not secure. It's very te tentative. It's not who we really are. So no wonder our culture and our politics and our religions are in the state that they're in because people are used to being looking outside for answers instead of this contemplative self, this deeper self, this connected with this miraculous being brings us to the new consciousness that we need to do all kinds of things in this world that touch lives and heal wounds and, and get rid of these defense mechanisms. You know, I recently went to um, an event here um, where it was with the woman who was the editor and producer of the film that was the documentary that won the Academy Award recently, 20 Days in Mariupol. And it was very interesting because being an editor, you know, I know a lot of you edit things in, for, for marketing and do things in that regard. And you know that you have to get in there and you have to tweak and you have to go over and over and over something. So while she was talking about it, and the, the film uh, uh, was the Academy Award winner, and it won because it documents this film uh, director's time in Mariupol, where he was documenting all of the first days of the war in the Ukraine. So as I listened to her speak about her time in in the editing of this and how careful they were and it took them months and months to do this and to get it to the caliber of the academy awards and my she they asked if anyone had questions afterwards and i raised my hand right away and i said can i ask you how being so intimately involved in the film and the production how did it affect you mental, mentally and emotionally and she right away said, my God, thank you for asking. You know, people don't think of that typically. And everyone in the room, you can see they're all people in production. So everyone in the room kind of like almost held their breath because they realized what that meant for someone to focus on that harrowing experience. The only reason I could ask a question like that is because I know the answer. Um, and, and it's important, like, and it actually was synchronistically that we wound up going out and, and talking to each other towards the parking lot afterwards. And, um, she said that she knew she was doing something that would be helpful for the world, like many of you, and it makes you then be able to be more, um, more miraculous in your nature, have greater capacity to do things. But what's really important, people ask me this all the time, like, Maureen, what about this over there? And what about this chaos in the world here? And you say, you know, everything can be a miracle. Her job in that film editing was harder than the people who were actually living the experience in the Ukraine. Think about it. If you've been in the middle of an experience and you're right there, if you're being present in the experience, you are dealing with things one at a time, like you watch them in the in the film, there's a hospital that's blown up and there are pregnant people and babies and people that are there. And you're watching a woman who's about to give birth with a blanket over her, walking around like, where, where do you go? Where do you even go? Everything's bombed out. 
And this guy comes up to her and says, uh, come with me. And she's like, right away, she's able to respond and be there in the experience because there's love present. There's caring present. You can feel a connection beyond the chaos. When you're editing something like that or you're observing something like that, the reason I'm telling this story is because we observe things in the headlines. I've been watching headlines for the last 26 years from a place of knowing miracles are real and watching how headlines do not help us evolve. They give us a little snippet of a story where there's miracles happening all through the every single part of that storyline. And people don't hear about the miracles. They hear about the chaos. And people then focus more on the chaos and they lose their capacity to focus on the miraculous. Now, here she was doing something that she knew would bring more awareness to the world and in a way that she was being able to be objective, but it's harder to watch. Just know that for all of you. It's easier to engage. It's easier to be the solution. It's easier to show up being the miracle that you are. I've been in a lot of circumstances that in my past, I wouldn't have touched with a 50 foot pole. But because I know miracles are real, and if you go in, you find them, you find them. So the other important one here is that many of us carry around judgment or guilt. That might as well be a black curtain between you and the miraculous world. Judgment is our fear turned outward. We judge whatever it is we feel we can't control or manipulate. If we're not going to love it, we're going to judge it. And guilt is that fear turned inward. So two sides of the same coin. You're either going to feel guilty about it. All kinds of people, oh, I wanted to help, but I feel so guilty. I couldn't drop it. It doesn't help. It doesn't put you in miracle mode. Again, you're better off. I don't know what this is, but I love it. Just let yourself love yourself for doing the best you can. We're all a work in process. We're all doing the best we can always. Another one is, this is a big one, especially for people who are healers here. Empathy versus compassion. I never, ever show up to a challenging circumstance where I say, oh yeah, I know, I know, um, and get in there in the trenches with them. I say, okay, I see. I, I I'm not being someone who's being distanced or things like that. I'm right in there. I'm really present with it. But I say, okay, come on, you join me in heaven now. You join me in heaven, we'll view this from heaven. I will not join someone in hell. That's a rule of mine. If you are in hell and you call me, you. I really highly recommend that for anyone here who's a healer, that if you really get this difference, compassion is where you're really connected. You're really wanting the best for someone. And you really, really, really do care. And you're really present but you're not being empathetic where you go in, see it eye to eye. Yeah. Oh, I can see, look what they did. Look what they, look what happened. You're letting yourself view it from that mile high view where you see there's a lot more to a story. There's a lot more going on. Okay. And then finally, there's the one that kind of usurps even people as they climb to the top of the mountain on a spiritual path. And they're really, really good at many of these things like being present and being wise and being compassionate and, and showing up 100%. This one does follow everyone up to the top of the mountain, and that's caring about the good or bad opinions of others. If you care about what others think, you're basically caring about judgment because mostly it's judgment or assessment. You're caring more about that than you are about love. So again, you're back to the guilt or judgment, kind of two sides of the same coin. If you care about what other people think, then you're, you're giving them the authority in your life. And that's not the fastest route to heaven or to miracles. I mean, as someone who is a tangible miracle worker, if I care about what other people think, I would be watching them go some of the time and I'd be watching them like you'd be like what's going on here and I'd stop midstream instead of going full out and so I learned early on and 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 I also learned th throughout these years you know caring about what other people think was a survival mechanism that we were taught since the day pretty much the day we were born as little kids in school and 
all the time. So pay attention to that one. Just put it on your radar that if you're caring about the good or bad opinions of other people, how can you be in that place, that deep place, that deep, connected, contemplative place that is where all the miracles reside? Okay, big, deep breath. I'm just going to give you five things that'll give you miracles really easily, just so that you have a takeaway that you can put to practice right away. And then a Q&A if we still have time. I'm sorry if we don't, because I talk a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, so the five things, five steps to be able to access or remember your miraculous nature really easily. Show up. Show up to life. People think they show up all the time, but they are not showing up. They've got 10,000 things going on in their mind. They've got a list of this, this wide. They don't show up. When you show up, it means you're deliberately, purposefully where you are at the time you're there. So just take a big, deep breath. That really helps if you're in a place and you realize, wait a minute, I didn't show up. I'm still at home. I'm still thinking about the thing, the phone call I just had before this. First, number one step, show up. Two, this will help you. Step two is pay attention. Use all five senses as you pay attention. Show yourself that you have this greater capacity for a wider capacity to bring in, to embrace a lot more. So if you use all five senses simultaneously, that automatically catapults us into our sixth sense. If you're, if you're letting yourself like really enjoy, think about the best meal you ever had and you're tasting it and you're touching it and you're feeling it going down. A miraculous state into that sixth sense. It becomes much more available to us when we're there. Next step, love it. Because this world of the miraculous is the world of love. You don't, enter it until you love it. So that mantra, I don't know what it is, but I love it. Just don't give your mind authority at the times when it's going to dim you down. We are taught to analyze and micromanage because we think it keeps ourselves safe, but that is not a contemplative way of safety. Safety is go deeper, be more aware, let yourself be in that place where you default to love just because it's, it's definitely more fulfilling and it's definitely closer to your true nature. You wanna be self-realized? This is the way. Miracles are a path that walks you to self-realization. And I truly believe mental health is awakening period. I, I believe that we all want, we came here to awaken. Start anywhere, stop anywhere short of that and you're not gonna be happy. It's not gonna be sustainable. So when you realize that you're here to awaken and the only problem is that you're the miracle and you forgot, then you're going to want to remember that has miracle after miracle after miracle. And then so that you get thrown into your sixth sense, love it because that's who you really are. That's your true nature. And then give up all judgment and guilt because you can't love and judge at the same time. Remember I said that's like a black curtain that goes that you're letting yourself be dimmed down. You won't, you'll know it because you're not loving it. It feels really awful at the time that is happening. Judgment and guilt suck the life out of you. They feel as though you have a heavy heart you have no agency. You feel as though you have no power. And so that way that you can say, okay, what can I do instead? Fill the void. If you feel a void, when you give up judgment and guilt, fill it with love. Don't know what this is, but I love it. So then you go up into the business of loving it. You'll surprise yourself and your miraculous self will show up. There's always more than we believe we are. And then finally, the one that is the one that follows people at the top of the mountain, give up all attachment to results. Don't, in, in this, it's in divine timing. That's the other thing. You can't manipulate miracles. This is not manipulation. 
This is where miracles are going to happen in ways that they always surprise you and delight you. And I highly recommend that you have another mantra that I say all the time. If I'm intending for something to happen, I say, bring it to me in ways that surprise me and delight me so that I know you're listening to me now. That way it's like, um, it's that fusing myself with my divine self. I know you're listening to me now and I'm actually joining you uh, with in one intention. And then the divine self of me, take care of it. I'm not gonna micromanage my life. If I'm miraculous, I want it to surprise me and delight me. And that's everyone's story so that you don't have to take my word for it. <laughs> Like really, truly, if you put these steps to practice, you're going to, uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've done a talk like this where people will right away write me like, you won't believe what happened, Maureen, after we, and I, I hear it so much. I, I expect it. I, you won't believe this, Maureen. Of course, I believe it because it always comes in a way that seems surprising and delightful, but I, it's all I believe in that this is the way we were meant to live. We were not meant to micromanage our lives or struggle or sift and sort our way through challenges and problems. That was my old perception. Now I know there's a, a better way. So <sighs> big, deep breath. Well, I do, Maureen, I, I was- <laughs> Maureen, Maureen, I'm gonna jump in here real Great. quickly. Um, you had some, you had, you cut out just a bit there. Oh, and um, in the five the steps one, or where? Yeah, the five steps. The first was show up. The second was pay attention. The third was love it. And I think we got the last was give up all, all attachment to results. But can you repeat number four? I think number four really... was great, really important. So you can yeah. have love and judgment or guilt holding the same space. They don't. So show up, pay attention mindfully on purpose, love it give up all judgment and guilt. Like that's a big one. I'm asking you for big ones, but if you want to awaken, this is how you do it. And judgment and guilt are going to be like black curtains that go over life between you and real life. You think you're living life, but there's a big black curtain in it because your judgment is coloring everything and your guilt is coloring everything. So you do things in a much less effective way. Miracles collapse time and space. And so that's why someone has a miraculous uh, remission of a, of a disease, or they had a, a problem relationship that they had a problem their entire life. And then they start, okay, wait a minute, I'm going to take this miraculous approach. And all of a sudden the person starts being more reasonable. And because this is the realm of the invisible, remember, it's like your breath. So you're not working hard at this. You're allowing yourself to align with a world that exists, but it's invisible to us while we're focused on this other world that's conditioned. It's the unconditioned world. Show up, pay attention with all five senses, love it, let go of all judgment and guilt. And then finally, don't attach to results because this is the one I was speaking about last is that it you want, you want divine timing, by the way, because the divine can put five things together in the background hum that you can only, you know, toil at one little thing. And the divine can do all these things for us. And that's what we miss the most. Like, think about it. If you wake up in the morning and you're not satisfied, or you feel like, oh, another day, or even if you jump out of bed to another day, Add this element of bringing in the divine with you because it's your true self. Why would you want to live a life distanced or, or detached from your true self? The more you get to know your true self, the more you love yourself too, by the way, because all of your gifts and talents come to light. You don't block the things that you are. It's, it's the person you came to be and miraculously, by the way, since this is a synchronistic experience, everyone in your life needed the real you, not the fake pseudo you all along. So any challenges you had in your life before this start to dissolve because the real you shows up and that's the one they really wanted. And that's the one they were giving the call for love for. You weren't being loved before, you were being something, a pseudo self like so many of us have been taught to be. 
So can you see how amazing this is that there's this whole parallel world that is true and does exist? And I will tell you, fortunately, I wouldn't have gone into these hard places, the challenging places like prisons or places like that, had I not right out of the gate seen my own pain, the things that really took me down as ridiculous and laughable and really know that. Um, it makes me, it's, I can't call it courage. I can only call it awareness that I, I woke up to the realization that this is a dream and we're dreaming dramas and we're dreaming nightmares. And if we know the real tools of how to wake up from that, oh, everybody'd give up that fixation on pain. It's not purposeful to get us where we want to go. It gets our attention. It makes us feel when we've numbed out, because if you really are in pain, you're in pain. But there's such a much better way to engage with this world before it becomes problematic would be ideal. Okay, I haven't looked at any of the questions here. I'm also going to put in the chat a meditation that I have that will, I really love this meditation. It's an inspired one. Um, it's, it's to access miracles now. So if you listen to this meditation this is not just like me trying to give you something that's not helpful this is a meditation that i truly put my whole self in to be a transmission so that you can access uh this world even when i'm not talking <laughs> at you <laughs> like this so are there questions <laughs> bring it to me in ways, yep bring it to me in ways that surprise and delight me and I add to that richard so that i know you're listening to me now because that's so comforting to us to have the divine be partnering with us um when we know that the divine is listening to us, we don't feel like we're doing this in a big void by ourselves. And then we don't have to default to try to micromanage it. We can actually relax. I often say the one who relaxes the most wins. And by that, I mean the one that goes relaxes into their true nature. So contemplative practices or spending some time alone in nature or in silence or just having fun in a way that feels more deeply connecting. Uh, it's it's you can't underestimate the power. Everyone in your world for the better it's you don't can, have can to you try. can you repeat that you you broke out there you said you can never yeah. underestimate and then it just broke out and okay. all of us were like what did she say <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what's happening because i told you i'm hardwired so i don't get this but you can never underestimate the power of your own connection because when you're connected by nature of that everyone gets the benefit of one person aware there's a line in a course in miracles i'll paraphrase it and it's a question of how many people does it take to awaken the world and the answer that jesus gives is one one awake person can heal the world like think of what the legacy he left in bringing love to the fore at, the, at a time in history where you know, the Jewish tradition had a very vengeful God who would like attack people and stuff. He brought the message of, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, it is all about love. But think of you awake in a room. And I've done this just for fun where people don't know who I am for the most part, most of the time. I'm very inconspicuous and I'm not someone that people would know I'm, I'm bringing a miracle here. But if you're the one person awake in the room, watch to stay awake and aware you might just smile in in the off to the side or you might just be the one who's thinking peaceful thoughts or blessing people in there and watch how it shifts the energy in the room watch how people start being kinder to each other start engaging with each other because this love brings and breeds connectivity so never underestimate your own power again what would be the problem if from this moment on, tomorrow morning, you woke up and said, oh, I get it. Every problem I could have today is because I'm a miracle and I forget. What if I just only focus on one thing? I'm a miracle. Can't deny it. Came in with your first breath and you're unbounded. You just put it in this body. And now I'm going to act like a miracle all day. I'm going to act with awareness of my miraculous nature all day. Just do it for fun. And I'm telling you, you do that and the divine meets you where you are. 
so that then you start seeing all these surprising and delightful things that happen. Can't manipulate it, but you can call it. You can focus in this way that then even the people who might have been, and again, I've done this in places that it's not, it's maximum security prison. And I've been in there where I'm talking with somebody and I didn't know you're not allowed to touch them. I didn't know you're, so I like touch someone's knee who's sitting next to me chained up with a guy with a machine gun at the end of the, t at the, of the room. And I'm talking and touching and the guards don't even see me. The, the prisoners are saying, don't, 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 don't touch. And, and I'm like, oh, you, I, I didn't know. Because when you're in miracle mode, the divine is there. You're just being the body because the divine is invisible. The divine is like our breath. It's there supporting us always. But somebody has to embody it for people to see it. And that's all you're really doing. It's not like you're doing anything. You're just letting yourself put a body over it to take me to get me in the car to drive to the place where I'm going or, or that kind of thing. So um, Maureen, oh, <laughs> I thought there was a question. Thank you for the gratitude and everything from everybody. Is there any questions? Like, did I say anything that really was a mind bender that would make you say, oh, come on? or anything, and I and you can unmute yourself if there is. Because again, in this world, by the way, miracles are 100% real and 100%, okay, I see Debra um, raise her hand. Um, there really is no place I've seen on earth that this isn't universally true in any place that I've been and I haven't shied away from anything. And I've said, send me, you know, tell me where to go, tell me what to do, tell me what to say and to whom, and I will to do it. And here's the big one, nothing more. I used to do way more than the divine told me. And then we get ourselves into problems and trouble because we're not only like stopping when the divine says, okay, that's enough. Oh no, but how about this? And we add all the extra, tell me where to go. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to say and to whom. And I will to do it and nothing more. I think I see. So someone, I don't know how to get Deborah. I, I can um, help. Uh, Deborah, it, can you go ahead and unmute? Okay. Hi. Hi. Oh, <laughs> You're <my>. miraculous. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> So, um, I think the one that one that I pushed up against is the is the forgiveness, and it's not that I don't there. I have actually there have been a couple people in my life where I really did feel like in that moment I was able to release uh, that pain. And then had these amazing dreams that um, confirmed that. And then, you know, time goes on and I find myself caught up in a, a tape that is not forgiving yeah. of, of the very same person. So m mom, as would be an example. And so wh wh how do you work with that? Is it just, I, I not just. I believe in miracles and I do. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, and you ask for that miracle of true, you know, and complete forgiveness of a person. How how do you deal with that piece of yeah, just parents, keeps popping up? <laughs> yeah, parents are a common, common theme, you know, for most people because um most people believe that they're angry at their parents for not being enough or blah 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 but they also have this underlying thing that they don't know about is where they feel that you know they had this perfect home before we arrived here that we can feel it part of us remembers our home in in the divine light and with the divine mother and father then we come here and it's like oh what the heck and they're the first faces that we see and they're the ones that condition us into this well-meaning of course but if you think of this not just with the parents but with everyone everyone's really doing the best they can 
they yeah. really are given given the past that they have that they haven't forgive given or given their life experiences everyone's showing up with some kind of baggage and what enlightenment really is like when people talk about enlightenment it's like okay i've had this backpack of rocks all this baggage and i finally lighten the load i let go of it uh, the light goes on in the attic i start to see i don't have to know what it is to love it it feels like lightness. It feels like less of the identification with a human body. So if you realize that anyone who's in a human body is conditioned into this experience to keep us safe and to keep us in a way that we can navigate this crazy world, and they all did the best they could. If you can default to that, like even in this moment, if someone's doing something radically dysfunctional in front of you, <laughs> and you realize they're doing the best they can. I have had clients that were in the throes of like violent circumstances where they were then miracle oriented enough where, like I said, don't, don't expect this to just kick in during crisis. It will help during crisis for sure. And get you through crisis for sure. But if you can be in this mindset all the time, and then a crisis comes being assaulted. And at that time said, I forgive you. I forgive you from a deeper place. And all of a sudden the person runs away. So it's, it's like someone has to remember. And if their way of being sucks you into the, dis, the disoriented or the disconnected place, then you're joining them there. And that's why I had to forgive myself because no one can do anything to you if you stay being yourself. And that's what we did. We came here to say, okay, can I be myself every day, all day, despite the fact that I'm in a world of separation? Look, we're in a world of separation, this and that, duality. Can I do this? This was supposed to be a joke. We're all divine. We can't go anywhere. You drop your body. You're still divine. You're going to come back. You're going to do all kinds of things. You don't, you're eternal. It's, you're not going to get it done. So when you realize that there's no threat, you look for each moment as an opportunity to experience more of yourself than you may have thought you were before that. I love everything you said. And mm -hmm. can I, I'm going to, I'm going to take it and then, and then turn it into something that I can practice today. Intellectually, what you're saying, and even on a deeper level, what you're saying, we are, we are all doing the best we can. We are all conditioned. My mom had some Oh, a tough way to go in her childhood. Yeah, and always. I totally get that. So when I get that up here and even here to a certain degree, and then that judgment pops up, you're, you know, basically, can I take from what you just said to me, just then come back to the, you know, come back to that parallel track, come back to, well, I, I don't know what this is, meaning me coming, having to respond love to judgment again. But I love it. So really, in a sense, I'm talking to myself, needing to wake yourself up, to wake yeah. yourself up, because no one else can do this. It's going to be between you and you. Ultimately, mm -hmm. other people can push our buttons and push us like the thing that makes us have to do this. Mm -hmm. But if you have really challenging situations that seem to make you each time disconnect and now you say, OK, I'm going to focus there. I'm going to see how can I stay connected in this? And you're really curious and you're really almost being selfish to the point that I don't care what they do. I'm going to be the person who can rise above this not in this egotistical way, but in this deeper connected way that you mm -hmm. feel this isn't all there is. This is only one teeny piece of a story. And I'm going to let this story evolve differently. Thank you. And Thank rewrite you. the story. That's the other part of this. We're creatives at our core. Our divine self is creative. Not, it doesn't make drama. It creates beautiful lives. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Appreciate okay, it. Great. <laughs> great. We're going to, we're going to go ahead and take the, uh, one last question from Samsung, and then we're right at time here. So if you don't mind, Maureen, we'll just take this last Perfect. question, Great. and then Thank we'll you. end right after that. And uh, thanks, everybody, for sticking on. And, and what a beautiful here. group of people. Of course, I know Richard is such a magnet to amazing souls, so I'm not surprised. Yeah. And <laughs> Kylie and all my other team, too. So we're, I'm really lucky. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But you bring it. Yes, hi. <laughs> Hello there, my name's Keith, not Samsung, believe it or not. Nice. Um, 
Yeah, for me, it's been around. This, I realized there's actually nothing to get, mm. but a hell of a lot to let go of. Mm. So it's actually been about letting go rather than gaining something. But my original thing for you was there was a, a line in the Course of Miracles that I almost didn't get any further. If you can remind me of it, 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 it was something like, we are the divine and everything else is false. Yeah. You know, that's the theme. That's the main theme of A Course in Miracles. And when I when I first looked at it with eyes that could see, when I picked up the book again, I had been struggling with it up until the point I had the experience that I had. And I didn't, I didn't understand it. I tried to do the lessons. I tried to live it, which was actually the most important thing unbeknownst to me, but I was trying to intellectualize and it made me feel stupid, made me feel like really inadequate. But when I picked it up and I looked at it for the first time with all those eyes that weren't filtered and I was in that space of knowing instead of trying to intellectualize, I was shocked to see that all it said over and over was love, every single sentence. So what you're saying about that, that's the theme that we are already divine and we forgot and that we already are in heaven and we don't know it. And I can attest to that, by the way, too, because life is so much different and, and it is a heaven where you don't want to change or fix things because you can see that even the things that are the most dramatic, like war or problems that we're having, they capture our attention in a way that when humans are in that place where they are inspired and not thinking solely with conditioned minds, we are solution oriented. And we're brilliant and we're genius at our core. This miraculous self is highly resourceful. So any of the problems that we are finding ourselves faced with now, like having to do with climate change or things like that, I'm fortunate in that I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is close to Harvard and MIT. So I'm around young minds that are genius minds all the time. All I have to do is go sit in a coffee shop and I'm going to hear this conversation that'll blow you away about what these kids are occupied in because we're leaving them a hot mess. And what fun for kids who are resourceful and genius and brilliant to be able to show up to that and find a solution of, for something that, you know, microplastics in the ocean that they know they can solve. So as humans, we're in an evolutionary state all the time. And if we truly believe that everything is a miracle or a miracle in the making, and if we don't see the miracle, if you don't see the miracle, then just default to this is a miracle in the making. Somewhere, somehow, someone knows their miraculous nature and they're focusing on the solution or the evolution of that. As eternal beings, we're going to be around for a very long time in some kind of form or shape and in some kind of evolutionary capacity. Well, whatever we can dream up that's a mess or that's a problem, we're here to be the solution. And I really believe that the people here in this group especially know that or else you wouldn't be compelled to be putting things out in the world. I don't think people are here to add to the noise. I don't believe that. I believe that you're here to bring, and if you don't want to add to the noise, then really be selfish with a capital S enough to really focus on what makes my heart sing. Because these kids, you wouldn't know when you see them in a, they don't even know how to tie their shoes sometimes because they're so like wrapped up in, in this thing that's like healing the world. It's, you wouldn't know these exceptional beings are just being themselves. They, they're not having the filter and they sure don't care about the good or bad opinions of other people because for the most part in their lives, many of them made no sense to anyone until they got to their peers in the places that have the same kind of minds. So it's really powerful when you realize that you can be solution oriented and that is much more exciting and more fun while you're here as well. But it, everything is... It, is unfolding to make us wake up. And here's the thing, the missing piece that I didn't know that was a the dawning realization for me during that experience of waking up. It's perfect. Not only is it, is it's perfectly evolving. It can't be better. So everything that happens when we see a disaster, 
if someone is aware in that experience, then they're going to evolve it to even a better place than it was before. The thing is, is we get, again, captivated by the headlines. And in this place where we keep feeling that it's been done to us or that we're inadequate or that we're broken or hurt to disrepair and all these things, when just breathe, just sit back and breathe and get into a space where you're not engaging with that for a little while if you feel overwhelmed, and let yourself just be, and then say, tell me where to go, tell me what to do, tell me what to say and to whom, and I will, this is your divine will, by the way, power center, I will to do it, and nothing more. Yeah. Yeah, lovely, thank you. Okay, thank you for the question, and thank you, everyone. I, I'm, I'm hoping that I get the chat so I can read these things, and I'm just going to put that meditation one more time in here so that if you guys feel like you need to continue the momentum, <laughs> listen to it. People have told me that it really like set them when they were off, totally off. They just listened to it, and they couldn't go back to that place again, so... Yeah, thanks. Thanks okay. again for being here, Maureen. Um, I think now everybody understands uh, why I tried to just give her the floor and it unfolded perfectly. Um, it's really interesting because uh, The Course of Miracles has been an influence for a lot of spiritual teachers. People don't know this, but it's the only book referenced in The Power of Now. I think I learned that from you, Maureen. Yeah. Um, and um that's why I read the power of David now, Hawkins. Right? I read the power of now because oh, right. I saw he referenced yeah, David that Hawkins. as the first quote. Yeah, David Hawkins, same thing. David Hawkins, it was his base, and he's like, a, it was like a big part of his um, unfolding when he was in his fifties before he had written all his books. Uh, and and um. And I just discovered Neville Goodard has uh, some amazing stuff. Uh, he he was pre Course of Miracles, yeah. But um, a lot of a lot of the stuff about Christ consciousness and the esoteric meaning of Christianity and and Jesus and everything. So anyway, it's just it's just a wonderful thing, and the fact that we can combine doing our work in the world, yeah. world by getting online with uh, raising consciousness and bringing on people like you is amazing within the soul syndicate and everything that we do so again i appreciate totally. you deeply thank you so much for spending thank you time thank you thank you field. everyone i, I want to help you get your message out into the world too so. <laughs> well thank you i i appreciate every single one of you and i know i can feel your hearts are really in this and then you couldn't have found a better person than richard to guide you along in this so enjoy and appreciate and have fun and receive 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 that's the other gift that a miraculous person just knows just receive it it's all there it's all for the giving and taking and receiving okay lots of love everybody all right. have a blissful okay. rest of bye, your day <laughs> okay bye